I'm Cody Vassi, the Executive Director for Private Protective Services, and I want to welcome everyone here. This is our very first virtual certified trainer meeting. Uh, we've already had one of these meetings in Memphis, but it was in person, so you are our test pilot, I'm afraid. Uh, we will be having one more seminar, and that would be in Middle Tennessee. So before I turn this over to Jeff for his presentation, of course, I wanted to say welcome. Thank you for your participation. What we are trying to attempt here is to have security guards on a post with the same training in East Tennessee as they would have in Middle Tennessee or West Tennessee. We have asked all trainers to send in their training forms, uh, training uh, material, along with their exams. And uh, Jeff and I have looked at that material, mostly Jeff has, but I have looked at a few of those. And we've been able to determine that not everyone is teaching the same thing, even though we do have a suggested curriculum. And that's what it is, is a suggested curriculum. We need your input. This is your profession. We want to, like I said, have the guards trained the same way. Uh, we want to establish a committee to be able to sit down and write the exams, make whatever changes need, need to be made. But bear in mind, some of these will be rule changes and some might be law changes. Some we might be able to do and some we might not be able to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry about that. I already attended one seminar this morning. And I do see and I wanted to recognize our assistant commissioner and I wanted uh, you to know our new assistant commissioner is Toby Compton, and since he's on, and I know he's extremely busy as well, I'm going to go ahead and ask him just to speak, to say a few words, if you don't mind, Toby. Yeah, hey, thanks, Cody. Uh, everyone, uh, thank you for meeting, <clears throat> meeting virtually. I guess we have to do that these days because of the conditions out there. Uh, I hope you and your families are well. Uh, we have been working on, on on completing this type of curriculum for a while. Kudos to Jeff for putting some of this together and Cody for, for their work and effort on this. It's a great way to kind of inform the community uh, because uh, your your industry is really important to Tennessee. Um, just for statistics, there are 373 certified trainers in the state. Uh, we have 560 uh, contract security companies in Tennessee, 22,415 unarmed guards, and 12,701 armed guards. So obviously a big industry that forms really important work across our state. Um, and I know um, Jeff and I know Cody does a great job uh, helping regulate this industry and trying to trying to uh, work with you guys as customers and partners uh, with the Department of Commerce and Insurance. Um, I just would like to let y'all let y'all know if you have any issues or questions or concerns, you're always welcome to reach out to me. Uh, we're we're always happy to uh, to hear from you and work together to find solutions for problems that may arise. Um, as you all know, um, this administration, the Lee administration, uh, like previous administrations, wants to be very focused on the customer, and we want to uh, be a state that is good for um, doing business. Um, with that, I'll leave uh, my comments there, uh, Cody, and let you guys get to it. Uh, just appreciate your um, all of you being willing to jump on today and. Uh, and, and learn learn a little something new. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Toby. We appreciate that. Again, before I turn it over to Jeff, like I said, this is your program. You're the certified trainers. We could have sat down and just maybe written up the exam and say, here you go, go ahead and do this. But we felt it's best for your input. Uh, so after this, we will, we will be trying to develop an exam for the unarmed and the armed that everyone would be able to take. So I'm just going, I'm, I'm going to get out of Jeff's way and I'm going to let him go ahead and do his presentation because I know all of us are extremely busy. But thank you for your time and hopefully for your input afterwards. Uh, if you have, want to send an email to myself or to Jeff with any of your suggestions, uh, if you want to perhaps serve on the committee, uh, any ideas that you may have, uh, We'd be glad to hear from you. Jeff, you want to take this from that, from here? All right. All right, I'd just like to, uh, again, thank uh, Assistant Commissioner Compton for uh, taking a moment to, to, to be with us. He was with us in Memphis and attended that seminar. And to have his support and have him present, uh, I think that speaks volumes. 
uh, to, to his commitment and uh, we'll certainly have to lean on him in the future for uh, as, as we move on with this. So we appreciate him. Um, on the screen now you see our uh, contact information. I think most of you have uh, have my contact information. I know I've recognized uh, many of the names that were up on the screen just a few minutes ago. But if you don't have my contact information, and I, I did send it out incorrectly once, uh, so there's our contact information. It is correct on the screen. And um, I want you to all know that I'm always available to, to help you. So if you have questions, uh, make sure you call and uh, I'll, I'll do my best to, to get back to you in a timely manner and get your questions answered. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, some of you know me from way back. Some of you don't. Um, I have um, most of my adult life. I've worked in teaching and training, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I worked for TWRA for many years, so I'm a graduate of the Tennessee Law Enforcement Training Academy. Um, I, I was a firearms instructor there. Uh, so I have a lot of, it, of background on um, ranges. I've been to the NRA Range Development School and Business uh, School. And um, so I have a lot of background in, in firearms and, and things of that nature. I have a master's in biology, so I'm trained as a biologist in the beginning. Uh, so I've done a lot of, uh, I still do some adjunct instructor uh, teaching and biology. So um, I've, I've worked on curriculum development and I spent a lot of time with TWRA with the statewide hunter education program and also statewide law enforcement training. And I think most of you can appreciate the importance if if we're doing a certain thing in Memphis, we need to do that same thing in Mountain City. Uh, if we're writing real tickets at one place, we need to write them at the other place. If we're training security guards one way at one place, we need to do that at the other place as well. So that's that's what we're uh, that's what we're really here for. And today we just want to discuss uh, where we are and maybe where we would like to be and lay out a little bit of groundwork of what it will take us to get from from here to there. Um, as has already been stated, we, we have a little less than 400 active certified trainers and you guys are, are our, our, our eyes and ears across the state as far as uh, you know what's going on, you know what is needed. Uh, we have a little bit of expertise in this office because we know maybe a law has changed or maybe it needs to be changed or there's a rumor that something needs to change about it. But you guys are out there uh, on the front lines on a daily basis, and uh, so we want to we want to have a uh, uh, an improved relationship and partnership with you guys because you are out there on, in the trenches. Uh, Toby's already spoken, so um, this next slide this is something that I wanted to point out. Uh, this is one of our rules. It's .09. And in the center of the page there, it, it, it tells that the, the, there should be an examination at the end of, of each one of these training segments. And specifically it, it, in B part, it says that it should be designed primarily to measure the applicant's knowledge in the field of security guard and patrol service generally rather than in policies, procedures, or requirements associated with a particular contract security company or proprietary security organization. So the reason I bring that up is um, the, the four hours, currently there's four hours of training that is required for unarmed security guards. And it's in the statute that way for four hours. And we just wanna make sure that, that no one is spending part of that limited amount of time talking about holiday pay or vacation accrual. 
those kinds of things are important, but they need to they need to come in the in the fifth hour or the second day or whatever. They don't need to be mixed up with the security guard training. Uh, so that's that's been in there for a long time, and um, and that's one thing that that we don't think needs to change. Uh, it still needs to be that way, and we just need to ensure that we conduct the training that way. So currently, we only have a what we call a suggested training curriculum. Um, it's four hours, and there's four one-hour segments, and they are listed in the state statute under 6235.118. So if we change that, if, if you guys feel like we need to be doing that for five hours or three hours or four and a half hours, then um, that will require a change to the statute. And um, that's not something that happens overnight. And uh, same thing with a rule change. That, that takes about a year to do. You have to open it, have hearings. And uh, so it's it's not just something that you decide on Monday needs to be done, and by uh, Wednesday or Thursday of that same week you get it accomplished. Uh, so currently we spend an hour in what we call orientation, and uh, we talk about the Private Protective Services Regulatory Act and administrative rules, the role of a security officer, and the attitude and conduct of security officers. And then the next section is. Uh, the legal powers and limitations. One thing that that we want to point out, and I think we do a good job of pointing out, that um, security guards are not law enforcement officers. They're they're not the police, and they don't have any special uh, arrest powers like like a sworn peace officer. And uh, so there's several sections of Title 62, Chapter 35 that regulates this industry that need to be gone over. And uh, there are also, most of you are teaching a few things from Title 39 and 40. Of course, Title 39 is where the criminal, that's part of the criminal code, all your firearms, uh, carrying guns on school property, all that stuff found in Title 39. Criminal trespass is another one that almost all of you probably talk about criminal trespass. And I would venture to say that uh, a security guard working on a post, probably in the first hour of the first day, will encounter a situation um, with somebody being somewhere they're not supposed to be. And um, so the next section is um, another hour, and it's dedicated to general first aid and emergency evacuation and notification procedures. Now, um, Depending on where you are in the state, those of you up there around uh, Anderson County Oak Ridge, you're going to have some very special um, sections in, in this particular part uh, that, that will need to be gone over. But again, it, that probably needs to be above and beyond just your basic um, evacuation and notification procedures. But obviously, if you work at a, a nuclear facility, um, you want to prevent everybody from walking around glowing in the dark. So you're going to have some very special uh, instructions that, that will need to go to those people. So we certainly understand that. And um, there's nothing in this proposal that would prevent you from going above the, the four hour minimum. But it you, you need to make sure you don't cut into the, the basic core that, that we need to have. And then the last hour is talks about patrol procedures, general security terminology, and report writing. And um, I, I know for a fact that, that report writing possibly <laughs> needs, to, needs to have an hour dedicated to it. But um, again, that'll be something that, that you know we all need to talk about and discuss. But uh, if you've ever written a report, and after you read a, a page or two, and you look up, and you think, I have no idea what, what I just read, then that's probably uh, not what what we're looking for. We want, we want people to be able to articulate what they saw, what they heard, 
uh, what intelligence they received and, and uh, put that down in a way that we can understand it and make something useful out of it because, you know, it, it could end up in court and um, under under cross examination and and so forth. It'll uh, a lot of stuff will come out of that. So that's really important. Then there's the examination. Uh, currently, we only have a mandatory of 25 questions, and um, you know we we have a, a different kind of a I guess an opinion on that. And uh, again, we'll we'll discuss that as as we go along. So um, basically, uh, that that's what we currently live by, and and have been for the last 30 one or two years, which is when most of our rules were originally written. Um, I got a place here to pause for questions, but I think Dustin is handling that with. So if you guys have any questions, I think Dustin has given you some uh, some instructions on how to do that. Dustin, do you think you should probably chime in and and tell them one more time here how to handle the questions? Yeah, I'll just uh, you, you can just post your questions in the, the chat and I'll just send out another test so you can see it. Okay. Thank you, Dustin. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And and thank you, Laura and Cody. I've got some, some uh, support staff around me that's handling a lot of stuff that uh, that is outside my um, my viewing area here, so uh, I want to thank them up front for that. There, there's some important distinctions that we would like to uh, like to make here. Um, everybody that calls in always wants to know about uh, their license. They want to know when when they should receive their license. When, you know what what's the status of my license? What's the and I just want to point out that that there is a difference in a license and a registration and a certification. A contract security company, when they apply, they possess a license. So when they when they make application to us and we send them uh, something official, they get a license. An, an armed and an unarmed guard possesses a registration. And then the certified trainers possess a certification. And um, and I do this too. I have to. I sort of have to catch myself sometimes. We commonly always refer to all of those as simply a license. But I just want you to to know that there is a difference. And if you actually read the rules and regulations and the statutes, uh, you'll see these words used. And and that is that's why that we wanted to make a kind of pull that out and, and point out that there is a difference in those things. Okay, all right, so somebody uh, has suggested 80% on the exam. We we have discussed that in-house, and um, that's always a question that comes up. And um, so we, we will, I guess I could say, we'll take that under advisement. Um, I, I do know that, that we have had that discussion uh, one day in here with, with our staff attorney that represents us, and uh, she had a number of other questions that followed that, so um, uh, we, we have made a note of that, and thank you for that. Okay, so... Um, Another thing that I wanted to point out, there there has been a uh, there's been a change in Title 62 uh, very recently, back on July the first. Uh, Title 62 was amended, and um, so now uh, 6235.119 just simply says that an armed or unarmed applicant is allowed to work an unarmed assignment on a copy of a completed application. And so we really uh, translate that by saying they have to have a copy of their application summary and a copy of the payment summary that, that 
that they have to carry on their person that shows they have applied and paid for the registration. And that is for unarmed only. If the if the applicant is an armed applicant, they can still work an unarmed assignment until they get that registration card. However, if they're if they're an armed applicant, they cannot work an armed assignment under any circumstances until that person receives the armed registration card. And um, we just wanted to point that out in case there was any any uh, question or confusion about that. All right, so the proposed new standards. Um, one thing I want to point out here is that this is just us talking. Nothing, nothing has been done. And uh, this would require a change in the statute. Uh, as I pointed out already, it, it's got four sections. They're an hour each. Um, so basically what I did here is I took the, the discussion from the um, rules and regulations and the, uh, all the Title 62 information. I took that out of orientation and moved it into the, to the next section. It just, it just makes logical sense to be there in, instead of here, at least my way of thinking. Um, and then I, I reduced that down to, to 30 minutes. And those are the ideas that we would still talk about in, in that section. What's that? I did, I, I mentioned that. That would, and again, that would require a law change. Because right now it says it, it takes, it, it has to be an hour. Then the next section, you should just have two sections here. It was the authority from TCA 6235, and then also the TCA 39 and 40 that we talked about. This is where I put the Tennessee Private Protective Services Licensing and Regulatory Act and Administrative Rules. That's included in 6235, but then the rules would also go here. So it just makes sense to put that here together uh, to just group it. Kind of like, you know, it, it's not all fruit. Some of it's apples and some of it's oranges. Well, that, that puts it all uh, the same kind of fruit in the same basket, so to speak. Okay, sure. We have a question, so we're going to go ahead and take that before we get too far down. Well, I think, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, the question or the statement is, if we're looking for standardization across the state, perhaps what we what would serve us best is an established slash standardized plan of instruction with an established slash standardized PowerPoint presentation. Agency can slash should add site or error specific training in addition to the minimum standards established by the state. Exam is the same. It should be a state provided and control item to ensure that it is court defendable. Okay. I mean, and, and I appreciate that question. And uh, I, I will tell you, um, I've, I've been here for a little over two years now, and I, I've actually written such a thing, at least for the unarmed. Uh, Obviously, we're, you know, this is not going to be Jeff Winfrey's idea of the way something should be, but I, I used your information, and, and I've written something similar to that. It's, a, it's in a PowerPoint presentation. It's just not ready to be released yet, but so um, I agree with, with, that, uh, with that statement, and um, we, um, you know, I, I told you I had some background with the Tennessee Hunter Education Program, and that's what we did. We had the same test. Uh, whether you're nine years old or 90, you took the same 100-question test at, at the end, regardless of how you got your education and information. So, you know, I, I'm, I sort of see that working in a similar manner to here, and um, and I agree that we should... Uh, once we decide what needs to be done based on what we know and what you know, then we should put that together, prepare that, and and send it out to you and, and provide that for you. Right, and the, the so the next question was about a lesson plan, and um, 
so uh, that that is what that is also what we would do when we form this committee. Um, we would write up the lesson plan and that would be administered out, sent out to everybody along with the PowerPoint and whatever slides or videos or, or whatever uh, that we were going to use. So that would all be provided uh, as a package deal. So. Um, Whoever uh, whoever came up with that proposal, if you are good at writing lesson plans, then uh, if you'll uh, if you'll raise your hand and uh, yeah yeah I learned that early. If you if you make a really really good suggestion, Cody will put you in charge of it. So <laughs> so the next hour uh, and and let's back up. Uh, the legal powers and limitations I, I put for two hours. That's a lot of information. And uh, so I felt like we should probably spend a couple hours on that. And um, and then the emergency procedures would be 30 minutes. And again, we just want to we're not we don't really feel like we need, need to teach security guards to be paramedics or uh, first year med students, but they do need to know basic first aid procedures. If somebody's slumped over and they can't breathe well, they do need to know how to to tilt their heads so they can have a better airway. Just something that simple could save somebody's life. Direct pressure on a, on a, a wound, um, a person can bleed out in two to three minutes from a, from a severe bleed. Uh, and then the best trauma surgeons at Vanderbilt can't put them back together if they're if they died and bled out in three minutes. So just little things like that we we need to include. And then again, the emergency evacuation and notification procedures. And then finally, the the last hour is just like the original fourth hour, uh, the patrol procedures, security terminology, and report writing. The examination. Again, uh, right now, it, it the rule says it has to be written, and and I'll just go ahead and throw this in. Uh, a lot of questions have come up, especially in the last several months due to the COVID-19. We have started allowing uh, the unarmed guard training to be done online, and we currently don't have anything that really speaks to how how do you change that. It's still supposed to be a written test, and you know how do you get an online test to be written and things like that. So those are some things that that need to be discussed. Um, but we propose a a um, hundred questions. It may only need to be fifty. Uh, I would think fifty or a hundred. It just makes it easier to do the math sometimes. Uh, um, Twenty-five questions is pretty light to. In, for the amount of information that that's there, again, somebody brought up, um, you know, you should make more than seventy percent. Um, you know, there's there's a couple of different schools of thought on that, and again, uh, it has been discussed, and we we are certainly uh, willing to discuss that even further. Again, these are just proposed uh, changes, and. Um, just discussion points right at this point. The licenses uh, or the related license, that's what we call it when we're when we're working on the uh, when we're processing an application that comes in, there's a section on there called related license and that's that's where a certified trainer has taught this person. One of the things that we wanted to take an advantage, take advantage of, and point out during this presentation, since I am talking to uh, primarily certified trainers, it's extremely important that we that we get the date and the score written in each of these sections. If it's an unarmed application or an unarmed applicant. Uh, that training form will have one date and one score found at the top of page one. If they're armed applicants, they'll go on and complete uh, the eight hours of classroom firearms training and the date and score of that information will be found at the bottom of page two. Then when you 
go to the top of page two, that's where the marksmanship training is found. And it too has to have a date and a score. And then if it happens to be a renewal, armed renewal application, that's recorded at the bottom of page two and the date and score is found twice, once for the um, classroom hours and once for the requalification. So date and score is very important. And another thing I want to point out here, uh, we, want, we want these training forms to be clean. In other words, uh, we don't need any stray marks. We don't need white out. Uh, we don't need a security guard going going into court for for some infraction that happened, and and one side or the other starts questioning the training form uh, because it it's got a score that's been scratched through and whited out and and changed. You know the question is going to be who who did that. So uh, we ask you to make sure that that you do do these things properly and and take. Uh, and most of you do a really good job with that. Um, that training form is is quite uh, cumbersome. Um, at some point in time, we'd probably like to to talk about some changes with that. But uh, for the time being, it it is what we have, and it is what it is, as we say. So make sure that you uh, pay special close attention to to that. And if you have a if you have an assistant trainer. Um, their name is going to be on the front page, but your name is also on there. And, and they, so you're certifying, your signature is still there, and it certifies that, that that assistant trainer did whatever they did under your supervision and your watch. So um, this is something that uh, that we want to make sure that that you uh, that you pay pay close attention to and make sure that the information there is accurate. I saw another question pop up. Go ahead, Cody. Let me get back. Let me get back over here to it. Something about right. up, updating this online. I'm trying to. Well, one question was from uh, Keith. He wants to know, can the uh, training form be online, which we are working towards that whenever we do the exam. Then there was another comment that this gentleman, uh, Charles, thinks the exam should be 75 questions. Okay. <clears throat> and, and I did see another thing pop up where um, it uh, somebody asked, Hey, can you mute? Yeah. yeah. The question was asked about uh, could could the PowerPoint or this information be up updated online? And and the answer, of course, is yes. Um, you know, once once we get this, once we get this like like we want it, um, if if a law changed or if there was some reason that we needed to to make a change to a slide or a whole section. We could we could make that and just roll out, just notify everybody. Hey, uh, the presentation has changed. Download it right here, and um, you you could always know you were using the latest and greatest version uh, of of that that application. So, and hey, Jeff. Is, yes, we could do that. Yes, Jeff. Sorry, I I just want to make a quick correction. Uh, Mr. Charles Manning Ewing said he thought that the uh, passing grade should be a, a 75. He, he didn't say uh, 75 questions. So okay. he's just saying okay. that he wanted, thought the grade should have been 75. I just want to make a okay. quick correction there. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Now I just addressed that. The question was about the about the the carry permit course and, and how that 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 is. So the Department of Safety did that a few years ago. They rolled out a change and um, and made it the same for everybody all over the state. And now, if they need to change that test, they will change it, and then they will offer that change for everybody's uh, consumption and all the instructors will be able to access it and have have the latest and greatest so um, appreciate those questions 
this is a copy of the training form and um so that's the top of page one that's 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 all we'll usually see filled out for an unarmed guard then if it's an armed guard they're going to fill out the bottom of that front page and you'll see I've circled some uh, important places, the training completion date, the score, the make, model, and caliber of the weapon. Um, when, when I was in uh, law enforcement, we, we made a big deal about serial number. Um, and, and here at Private Protective Services, serial number is not, uh, not something that we, that we usually look at. But the, the make, model, and caliber of the weapon has to be listed. So um, just keep that in mind. And then this is the top of page two. This is also for armed. And this is the four hours of marksmanship training where you go to the range and do your firearms qualification. The make, model, and caliber needs to match what's written on the first page. And then the training completion date and score is there. Uh, when I was at TWRA, we started doing a pass fail instead of a numerical score. Currently, the, the, our rule and the law requires a percentage type score. So uh, if, we ever, if we wanted to change that to a pass fail situation, it would require it. another Listen change. And then at the bottom of that page is where the um, armed renewal training is. And uh, that requires two hours in the classroom and two hours on the range. Of course, the classroom is anything that, uh, you know, you want to go over the laws, review the, the, the re and, and nothing really much changes about that. There's the same reason that you were allowed to shoot somebody 30 years ago. Is that's not changed. Um, and so you have to, um, but you have to go over that, remind everybody of, of uh, what the um, um, I, I don't understand. There's something that's popped up here. I'm trying to read. I've not seen yeah, this before. Yeah, it's Dustin. Do you see that? I'm sorry. What's that? Uh, Somebody has put up an annotation request. Um, it's gone now. I didn't know if that was something I needed to look at or what, but I'm I'm a, I'm a newbie on all this stuff, so uh, I'm uh, printing some of this stuff as it comes across. So at any rate, um, that's the um, that's the training form. Let me back up here just a little bit. Does everybody see that there at the top of page two where it says where it says note if this individual changes weapons he or she must complete this four hour block again and the use of the new weapon and a new completed training form must be submitted. There's a lot of confusion it seems like about when somebody wants to use multiple weapons. Um, you know, when I was in law enforcement, we if we wanted to carry an extra gun, we just qualified with it, and we could carry that off duty. Um, the only guns that a uh, an armed guard can carry are those that they have actually qualified with, and they have to be of the uh, the caliber that's been approved by the commissioner. And and when they do this, they do an extra weapon. Uh, it's supposed to be filled in up there, so they would they would have this page filled out as well. Let me get back down here to it. They would have this page filled out, and then for the extra weapon, they would they should have this page. And a lot of people will go to the top up here where it says certificate of successful completion, and they'll hand write up there additional weapon. And and we we do take them that way. There's there's not really much of another way to indicate what that is exactly. Um, we also sometimes see where people have gone in and changed this form. This form doesn't have a place at the top of page two for the person's name. If we see one like that, we know that it has been altered, 
and it is it's against the law and rules to alter a state form like that so uh, please don't do that um, work with us and we'll try to we'll try to make official changes somewhere down the road um, so there's a there's a lot of things that um, that we see some one of the biggest problems we see when we're processing an application is that there's a lot of missing information a lot of a, a lack of documentation uh, there's a lot of documentation missing so a, a good example the, the law says that you have to be uh, a u.s citizen in order to be an armed guard or an unarmed guard well, if you send in, if you say that you're a U.S. citizen, but you're born in Japan, then that is a problem with us. We cannot accept that without documentation of how you became a U.S. citizen. If you were born in Japan, you probably have a certificate of birth abroad. Um, you know, if you were born to military parents or something like that. So that is uh is something that i feel like that that the certified trainer should just mention it won't take but a minute or a few seconds to mention it if there's 30 people in the class and one of them is in that situation it'll just remind them that, that they need to document the low income fee waiver is another one you, you've got to send in documentation uh, if you want your fees wavered so without that documentation it causes us to have to to send out letters, it causes us to uh, have to. It, it throws us in a in a backspin, and it's hard to, for us to work the application. So, um, another big problem we have is those of you that are still using paper applications. Um, when the laws change, that that law change that we had in uh, in July, no longer are we required to document five years of residence or five years of employment thank goodness we finally got that those questions removed and um, but if you've got a if you're using an old paper application that you've had for 15 years and you're just making copies of it you're still going to have people trying to figure that out and fill all that out and taking the time with it and it's not even required anymore but but what's worse is there's a fingerprint uh, acknowledgement policy that that will not be included, and a low income fee waiver that will not be included, and we can't process those applications without that. So then that throws us back in that loop. So um, if you've absolutely got to use a paper application, you need to get contact us and make sure you've got the latest version of that uh, but we we greatly appreciate if you can if you can try to move everything to the online application and those of you that have worked with that for the past two days um, it's probably good that we're doing this virtually because if we were in person you might be trying to shoot me right now I, I know that you've had some problems in the last couple of days with that but um, I spoke with a trainer earlier today and, and he said that they were hoping to have that issue resolved by later today or tomorrow. So just bear with us. We're, we rolled out a lot of new stuff this week and um, it's, it's not all working perfectly. Uh, just real quickly, uh, the Tennessee Code Annotated is what we call the statute, the state statutes. And all the laws that uh, that govern private protective services can be found in Title 62, which is the name of that is Professions, Businesses, and Trades. It's in Chapter 35, which is the Private Protective Services Licensing and Regulatory Act. There's 142 sections total. Uh, I've got them all on this presentation, but we're we're not going to stay here till four or five or six o'clock tonight going through them all. Uh, if if you have a question about one, we'll we'll gladly uh, go there and visit it. 
they're all in the presentation, but but we're not necessarily needing to cover all of them, and we're not uh, proposing to change all of them either. Um, we just there's a few sections of a few of them that that need to be tweaked a little bit to uh, to to help us out if if we get to that point. Uh, th this slide here is it's very busy. It's got a lot of uh, complicated stuff on it, but basically this is how you can can get to the uh, the Lexis Nexus website and uh, and find all the state laws. Um, and you can go there, and there's no fee for you to go there and use it. Uh, but uh, you you can go there, and um, you can find it by going to our uh, PPS website. But um, as I've told people before, I, I have all this stuff bookmarked on my computer, so it's easy for me to go to it. But if you're going there for for the first time, you have to start with Tennessee.gov and then and then go down and and find your way there. So once you stumble across some of these things, which is how I find a lot of stuff on the internet, um, I try to bookmark it so if I want to go back to it, it's uh, it's easy to do. But that information is there. Um, I can give you a copy of this later, and uh, it'll be there if you if you choose to look at it. Um, I wrote this out and just sort of, um, and the, the, I think I just saw a question, will we, will you be provided a copy? And uh, if you want a copy, I think we can provide that to you. Um, so we'll just, uh, it, it will also be on the website and I don't know how to go look that up. We may have information for you to do that later. Um, I, I don't know that right now. Again, um, It'll it'll be harder for you to go find it than uh, because you just have to go through a lot of layers to get there. So if if we can find out how to do that, I'll I'll pass that along. But basically, um, certain sections apply specifically to security officers and guards, and and I've listed those there. Uh, if you go and read them, the ones that are talking about security companies, they'll talk about licensing requirements and then when you go and look at those similar statutes above there they'll talk about registration requirements so that's where i told you earlier there's a distinction between a license and a registration and a certification uh, if you go down and look at a certified trainer the two sections of the law that deal specifically with that is 126 that's what creates the certified trainer and all the requirements to be one. And then 140 talks about the continuing education components. And um, and that's just dedicated kind of to certified trainers. So I'll skip over that one. Um, the, the next section, the next several slides here, um, 28 through... Got some notes and I've, I've passed them here. Um, 28 through about 31, um, they just list the the name of the of the law. And in red, I have put some notes in there. So I've got one of these books that that I that sits by my desk. And when you call me and start asking me questions about what does the law say about this, that, or the other, I've got this copied. It's sitting right by my, matter of fact, my left arm sits on top of it all day long. And so I have notes in it. So that's what these red marks are. So um, if if you're a sworn peace officer and you want to get your armed guard license without going through the training, um, this part of the law addresses that and talks about that. So I wrote sworn peace officer there. Go to the next slide. You've got uh, two or three slides there. Um, 117 talks about armed and unarmed disqualifiers. There are some 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 disqualifying reasons that you might not be able to get an armed or unarmed registration card. There's also now the Fresh Start Act that um, that mandates by law every case on a case by case basis has to be looked at and um, by 
I think Cody, are you the only one that does that? Cody and Diana Taylor uh, do that, and, and they have to apply the Fresh Start Act to every um, indication here. If, if somebody has a, a, qual a disqualifying event on their uh, TBI background check, um, they may still be able to get a certain type of uh, registration, but they have to be reviewed. So, um, and I've got all that uh, on here. It's just later on. Uh, Section 118 talks about the training standards, which is, uh, I'm, I'm quite familiar with that. I've read it uh, upside down and backwards many times in the last couple of years. Um, Section 120 says if you've been arrested, you've got 30 days to notify us. Uh, on the next slide, um, there's a couple of them there that deal uh, specifically with proprietary security organizations. Uh, Section 125 gives guards the authority to carry a weapon. Um, 126 talks about certified trainers, 127 uniforms. Section 129 is the, is the law that says private protective services can promulgate rules and regulations, and that's what gives us the legal authority to have rule number 0780-05-02. That's our section of rules. Um, and then uh, 6235 is where the Fresh Start Act is mentioned in the, in the law. And um, then 140 there is what requires the 12 hours of uh, continuing education for the certified trainers to renew. Um, this is the, the specific one about uh, 129. Um, basically, the, the rules are, are provided. They're there to, to help agencies administer their policies and enforce their policies. Uh, when I was with TWRA, we had rules and regulations. Every state agency has rules and regulations that are, um, that are there. They use them to assist in the enforcement of their, of their chapter and, and to regulate their industry. Um, the next group of slides cover the specific laws, and um, does 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 anybody have a question about a specific law that that you feel like that we that we need to address here today? I, I do want to talk to you a little bit about the rule, but before we get to that, um, does anybody have a specific question about any particular law? Something that's really been bothering you or burning in your uh, soul that you needed to have an answer to. If not, um, we we again we don't have to go over every one of those rules. I I, I will point out one or two of them. Um, but the rules. Um, one thing I want to point out: if you read our rules and regulations you'll see that most of them were written in 1987 and they became effective in 1988. Well, that was over 30 years ago. And um, most of those rules have not been touched since then. Some of them have. Uh, 0.25 probably didn't even exist back then. That's the special events permit. When did that come along, Cody? Five years ago or less? So, so that one is that one's pretty new, but most of these rules have been there for a long time, and um, so 30 years ago, the word online. If if I told you something was online, you you would think I meant that somebody was online too, waiting on the phone for you. You know that that word didn't even exist. An active shooter, that meant something. It just wasn't in our vocabulary back in those days. Um, so it's probably time to go through and um, and and you know and sweep out the cobwebs and tidy some things up a little bit. Uh, and and some of the stuff that we're talking about doing, 
will require that we go in and visit some some of those rules and and make some some changes. Um, I'm going to go real quick. I'm going to zoom down here to 118. Uh, section 118 is is the the law that that that's where our training uh, is is found. Uh, you'll you'll see um, right here in in the first section. It just talks about training and examination of applicants. And you see up there it says registration cards. So who has a who gets a registration? That's the armed and unarmed guards. So this section 118 is talk when it talks about the training and examination of the applicants. These are these are not security contract security company applicants. They are armed and unarmed guard applicants. And then uh, section two says both the unarmed and armed shall complete at least four hours of general training. So that's where our four hours comes from. And then when we go to the to the next slide, there it is, A, B, C, and D. That four hours is divided up into one hour of orientation, one hour of legal powers and limitations, one hour of emergency procedures, and one hour of general duties. So if we were to change that to five hours or three hours or four and a half or uh, 30 minutes for one, two for one, hour and a half for one, any of that, it will require that that law be amended. And um, again, that takes, um, that that's not an overnight procedure. So, um, something we'll we'll talk about. And then again, I'm just going to kind of go while, while I have uh, most of you and you are uh, uh, certified trainers. Uh, I get a lot of questions about what kind of weapon can a person carry and and basically um, it, it's not it's not a real open ended uh, discussion. They're allowed to carry a, a pistol or a revolver, and, and it's written right here in the rule. Um, the firearm is a standard 38, 32, 357, 9 millimeter, 10 millimeter, 40 or 45 caliber revolver or semi automatic pistol, a standard 12 gauge shotgun, or other firearm approved by the commissioner. And there are no other firearms approved by the commissioner. Uh, the 380 auto and the 357 SIG was specifically added uh, a few years ago. I've got the I've got those notes in my um, book if you want to know exactly when they were added. But as if those of you that are gun enthusiasts, the 380 and the 357 SIG are both nine millimeters, so they were kind of approved up there where it said nine millimeter, but um, they, they've been added now specifically by name by the commissioner. So, um, and then the big thing here, we currently do not allow any type of rifle. And um, so um, I, I cannot uh, speak on behalf of the commissioner. I don't know how many questions that he gets on this, but I, all I can tell you is that right now uh, we are not authorizing any rifles for any any location. Okay, we got a we've got a chat question that's come up, and we're going to go ahead and uh, entertain that question. Well, I think I just lost it. Oh, Steve Fisher wants to know why are certified trainers required to obtain their armed guard registration cards to operate as an armed guard? The simple answer there is the statute says if you're going to be an armed guard, you must be trained by state certified trainer. One thing, a state certified trainer cannot train themselves. We know that. The other simple answer there is you're the trainer, you're not going out under normal circumstances to a post 
But I'll take the opportunity right here to say if you are a certified trainer or a company owner and you do go to a post and your guard is not there, in order for you to stay, you would have to become an armed guard. But this is a question that I think we can address whenever uh, – we take a look and we have the committee as well because it's been a question that's been asked lots of times. If I'm a certified trainer, I'm training a guard. Why couldn't I just automatically get my armed guard card? That would require a law change. But yes, we'll look at that for you, Steve. Thank you. Okay, that's a good good question and uh, and a good very good explanation. Um, you know, sometimes we we sort of get caught in a I, I guess what I'd call a catch twenty two. You know, we're um, sometimes something that makes perfectly good sense uh, is just clearly not authorized by the statute. Um, maybe it was never thought about, or maybe it was thought about, and it was designed to be that way on purpose. I, I don't know that, but um, we just sometimes find ourselves in a in a kind of a catchy situation like that. And um, you know, it only makes sense that if you can train armed and unarmed guards, you should be able to be one. But the only way you can be one is to be one according to the way the law prescribes it. So, um, so yeah. Any other questions about, about that? While I've got you here and you are um, a certified uh, trainer, well, before I get to that, let's just let me just go ahead and say, OK, so in in section 130, that's where um, uh, it, it tells you that uh, that's where the Fresh Start Act is mentioned. And I just went ahead and put put that slide in here. And if you look at slide number 98, um, these are the things that Cody and Diana Taylor have to look at if if you are a convicted felon or if you have a certain misdemeanor that would normally prevent you from uh, getting an armed or unarmed registration card, they have to look at, at the situation. Um, the You have to have been to court, paid all your fines, all your restitution, everything, including five years has to have passed since you've done everything you're supposed to do. Probation, you finished your probation. It has now been five years later. Now you can apply and they will look at these six items to determine whether or not you can or cannot be issued a registration card, either armed or unarmed. And there, there's the six things. It's I, 2I, 3I, IV, V, and VI. Those are the six items um, that 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 they have to look at. Do what? Um, the nature and seriousness of the crime, the length of the time since. You know, if somebody did something, it's been 40 years. They may be rehabilitated. You know, if they've if they've been able to not repeat that since in 40 years. The relationship between the nature of the crime and the purpose of regulating the occupation. Uh, a good example of that is if you're convicted of bank fraud uh, or embezzlement, uh, you, you may not be a candidate for uh, uh, Brink Security working on the uh, armored car at a bank vault at the Federal de Depository or Repository or whatever it's called. Just things like that. They have to look at, at that. Uh, number five, any evidence of rehabilitation or treatment. So if you've been in a professional treatment program uh, and it, all that's documented and it's and the time has passed and um, all those kinds of things is what they have to look at. Um, so it, it is possible in some cases that uh, you may still be able to get a, an armed or an unarmed registration as a result of all that. And then finally, you got a question? OK. OK, there's another question, so we'll uh, take that question right quick. Or a statement. Can an agent training working under you certify you? A-D-J-U-C-T. Can an adjunct. agent adjunct 
or I, assistant can assistant an, can assistant no. trainer no assistant trainer didn't qualify to get the same as a trainer correct that's correct i i think we need to i think we definitely need to stay away from um training each other and those kinds of relationships i um that might be a question that, that we need to to let the the legal folks um come up with a with a, a legal answer I, you know i'm not an attorney but uh the the look of impropriety exists when we start uh, when i start certifying cody and cody starts certifying me to to do things here in the department um that that doesn't doesn't look well sometimes another we got another question yes <clears throat> let's go back and find it again terry wants to know under section 15 it states approved by the commissioner my company provides armed security services to universities since these rules were written years ago and there have been several school shootings especially within the university setting since these rules were written what would be a suggested guiding process to petition the commissioner to allow patrol rifles within certain certain sets, settings such as universities well i can answer that for you you can uh send that information to me on your letterhead make that request i will present it to toby compton who is assistant commissioner who will uh discuss that with the legal and he will present it to the commissioner and so far the commissioner said under no circumstances will there be rifles allowed now that does not mean to you uh, six months from now a year from now that might change but in that request you're going to have to do some good justification of why you would need that specifically and the one of the hardest problems is whenever we give a guard the card, the registration card, to be an armed guard, it doesn't say you're an armed guard for an armored car, you're an armed guard for a university, which means you can carry a rifle, uh, but you're just an armed guard to, say, stand there and work at uh, Kroger's. So we don't know where that guard might be moving around to. So if we start certifying the rifles, there's going to be a problem with that. But yes, you can ask, you can commit, uh, ask the commissioner that, but you're going to have to give a plan, explain exactly why it is that you would need this and what setting these would be in. For instance, we had talked about how are these rifles locked up when they're not in use? What is the time frame from a, for a guard or to move from point A to point B to open that locker? What's the percentage of time? There's a lot of questions that go into that. But if you want to submit your course, I would be glad to, I mean, your request, I'd be glad to submit it up to the commissioner for you. Thank you. Okay, before I, before I forget, um, while, and while I've got you kind of all here and, uh, and got your ears focused and, and eyes focused here, uh, I just wanted to say one real quick thing about your continuing education requirements. I almost wish I could pull up my my core um, thing here where I have to document this. Uh, when I document your training, when you recertify or when you renew your uh, certification, it requires that I put a, a completion date and the total number of hours that you received when you took that class. While the NRA is an, is an excellent source of training, and, and I've had this discussion with them, and I told this to them on the phone, they're one of the worst to document the training because they sometimes don't put the date you completed it. They'll put an expiration date. Some of their stuff is good for a year, some two, some three. Uh, they almost never put the number of hours and when I ask them about that, they'll say, well, our training is competency based. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a real good gun person and it only takes me two hours and somebody's never picked up a gun. It might take them 10 hours. But at the end, we both get a we both get a certificate saying we're competent in doing whatever that was. Well, that's 
that's okay, but it's impossible for me to document when I have to put down a date that you completed it and the number of hours it's worth. So if those two things are not on the certificate, you you can you can send me stuff that I couldn't fit in a yellow pages phone book size folder and I, I can't document it if it doesn't have the completion date and the number of hours. So please remember that. I'm I'm an advanced EMT. I just got through I know what you guys are going through. I just got through sitting. I sat on the computer all day long and all night long for a week trying to finish up my continuing education for my EMT license. But every document I submitted had the date I finished it and the number of hours it's worth. And I even have to specify whether it's medical, pediatric, or whatever. So, um, you know, just just remember that to help me out as much as possible when you're when you're doing this to, to make sure that you give me a completion date and the number of hours that it's worth. Some of the stuff from the NRA, I know what it is, but um, sometimes they have some stuff that it's not not I don't it's not on their list. So uh, make sure you you give me that. And I think there was another question. I saw something about PSOs and churches. And there's one before that, so we're going to take the next questions. Uh, can the caliber of firearm be placed on the guard card so employers to know what the student is qualified to carry? Say that again, though. They want to know whatever weapon that the gen the guard is carrying. Can you put it on his guard card? If they, oh, it's not it's not written on the card. No. I don't know what that would take. That would take, I, I wouldn't say that can't be done. I mean, we sent man to the moon and, and retrieved him. So I, I think a lot of things are possible. But um, now on a, on a certified trainer, on the back of their little card, I think it tells whether they can do firearms or unarmed. But I'm not aware right now of anything that would allow that. So that would require, I'm sure it could be done, but it would. I'm going to raise some questions because you're talking about uh, putting on his card, his primary weapon. What do we do? We have guards that send us and add a weapon. It might be 15 of them. You'll be surprised how many weapons these guards are certified in. So it had to be that primary weapon that he did at that when he made the ap actual application. But I think that's something the committee can look into. Yeah, sure. We can look at that. Uh, the next one is from James. For churches that have volunteer armed security persons, are they required by law to have the armed training? So let me explain this to you. For a church, since you asked the church question. If the, anyone is volunteering and they're not receiving any type of compensation, they do not fall under 6235. The church can do whatever it wishes to do. Uh, if the church decides to have armed security guards that are certified through the state of Tennessee, the church must become a PSO. That is free. All we do, they just fill out a form and give us a proof of insurance. But the security guards that were, are with them must be certified through our office. Thank you, James. That, that's a good question. I have a lot of uh, questions about church security and, you know, who would have thought, like I asked Cody today, who would have thought we'd have to present to you guys this way today? Who would have thought five years ago that we would need an armed security team at church on Sunday? But you know that's that's where we are that's just where we are these days and uh and and i you know i will say that the the nra when i took that range development course they talked a lot about uh level of care and and if you ever have to go to court about anything the higher level of care that that you exercise up front is is probably going to be beneficial to you down the road um, you know if you've got a church and nobody's nobody's certified nobody even has a handgun carry permit and somebody gets shot there 
all that's going to be taken into question. If you have a church that has a security team and everybody is trained, if everybody is a certified or a, a, a registered armed guard and everybody has a state carry permit and the church is a PSO and somebody gets shot there, there's going to be all kinds of lawsuits. Same, same scenario. The difference is going to be you look at the level of care of the two of the two circumstances that I just described. So, you know, it's just like buying buying plenty of insurance. Um, just because you've got good insurance doesn't mean you want to be careless and use it. So, uh, but I think it's always better to err on the side of caution and uh, and be trained as as adequately as possible. Any other questions? I just wanted to show you real quick what most of these rules look like. At the end of every rule, it'll say history. And as you see on this one, um, original rule filed November 17th, 1987, effective January 1st, 1988. And almost all of them say that. So uh, again, you know, our, our rules are, you know, they just don't, have a lot of the information in them that that we need to be able to uh, to say some of the things we want to say now about online training and um, you know other other things similar to that. And I just wanted to point that out to you that you know most of them have that. Um, I guess I could go down to the very last one and I could answer my own question a while ago about number fifteen, the special event permit. Original rule was filed April 25th of 2018, effective July 24th of 2018. So that's that's how old that particular one is. Um, and if you don't know what that is, events like Bonnaroo and things like that, uh, we issue or we let people be uh, security guards at, at venues like that based on this special events permit now. Uh, versus the way we it used to be done. So that's just an example of uh, of kind of where we are. Um, I, I don't think I have any other specific um, thing that I have skipped. Again, I, I want to reiterate that um, nothing we have talked about today uh, has been changed. Um, it's just that these are some of the proposals that that we've come up with. Um, I haven't had anybody to to disagree with me that we need to have uh, statewide training and have it all be the same. Uh, if you do feel adamantly opposed to that, we certainly want to hear from you. But um, I think most of you are in agreement that that it's time to 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 move in this this direction and um uh, i'm i'm real excited to be a part of it um I, i've i've done a lot of teaching and training and curriculum development and uh it's very exciting to to be able to to look at this and be a part of this that was a question cody asked me at the interview uh she asked me could i could i do this and i said yeah I, i'm i'm your person of course, she told me later I was the only one that applied, so I, I'm not sure how how I got here. But anyway, um, we're we're excited to be able to to offer this and 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 at least step in this direction. I saw another question pop up, something about the special events. I think. Let's see. Is the special event permit only per, only pertain to contract security companies? Do PSOs have similar process? No, they do not. This, the uh, event permit is for contract security companies only, and that does require for you to ask in advance five days for the event, and it does require that you give us a, a, a at least a temporary roster of guards that you think that you're going to put put on. Then after you've uh, assigned everybody to their post or wherever they're going to be working, then you submit your uh, final roster. But thank you for that question. And, and also, I think the biggest difference between between 
a proprietary security organization and a contract security company. A contract security company is in the business of providing security for these big events. A proprietary security organization is just out there protecting their own their own backyard. Um, I guess they could have a throw a big party or something and and need something, but uh, that's kind of the difference in those two entities, I guess. Okay, got some other questions, and we'll I'll move on with this one. Let me get to this. Hold on just a second. Uh, getting back to the continuing education, do you have any recommended resources for training? And I, at this time, I, I do not have any, but that's what we hope we're going to establish, is to have a, a training for the guards, what material. And I believe later on, with uh, Jeff's assistance here, we're also going to have a train the trainer course, is what we're going to try to have as well. But right now, we're just taking baby steps and getting this started. Uh, and then we have another one that says, uh, Jeremy was a little late joining us. He wants to know if we're going to email the presentation. If you want the presentation emailed to you, uh, Jeff will be glad to do that for you. Just, just let him know. Just write me an email and, and ask me for a copy. That way I can, uh, that way I don't leave anybody out. Um, Uh, we got another question. They they pop up, but they disappear before I can read yeah. them. I'm a slow uh, I reader. No. <laughs> okay, it says if a retail business holds a tent sale, for instance, that is on a separate piece of property, would this be considered a special event permit situation? I don't know if I can answer that question right now. The special event permit. Is for special occasions such as Bonnaroo. It is not, for, it's been deemed as not for, say, like uh, the hockey teams or the football games or anything of that nature. It's a real special event. So a tent sale, you would have to ask to send it in and ask the commissioner for that guidance and uh, explain where, when, how, and how many security guards you have at that particular place. It's a little bit harder to answer. Thank you. In, any other any other questions out there? Now's now's your time to. Uh... <laughs> you okay? Uh, first of all, it's, can you go ahead and send this presentation to all on the address list so we don't have to individually ask for the rules and the regs too? Well. I, I can. Right. That, my only thing is I I left somebody out and I, I feel really bad about that. I'll I'll do my best. If if I don't get it to you, then send me something and I'll and, and that's another thing I want to say to all of you. Um it is very important that you maintain a good tele a good working telephone and email address and make sure that we have that um, accurate on your application uh, or on your actually on your file. It's not a, really an application anymore once it becomes it's your permanent file that we have. So I look up your number and I can find your your address. Uh, that's important as well. But the telephone and email um, you know, this this is where we are now. So that th we need those things to to get in touch with you. So, um, and even under the best circumstances, I, I left my my buddy Kenneth Potter off somehow. Or another, I don't. I, I think I had to work hard to do that because I can't figure it out. But um, I'll try to try to get it to you. All right, we have another one here from James. Can a person with an armed registration card that is not associated with an ar armed security company perform armed security duties? Well, I had to think about that one for just a minute, James. Anyone who has a armed or unarmed registration card must work for a registered company or a proprietary security organization. They cannot go out on their own. 
They cannot work independent. There's no such thing in Tennessee as an independent security officer. They must be working under the direct, I'm going to say, supervision of a uh, licensed company. Read, read the definition number 15 here of what a security guard or an officer means. So it tells you right there, it's an individual employed by a contract security company or PSO whose primary duty is to perform any function of a security guard and patrol service. So there again, as Cody just stated, they, they can't work, they can't be a freelance uh, security guard. They got to work for somebody, some uh, contract security company or PSO. Get back. Every time I click on that, it moves off of here. Keith is asking or making a statement. There should, I think, be an instructor's class for methodology. Methodology? Uh-huh. Okay. Thank you, Keith. And, and as Cody mentioned, uh, I, I didn't say a whole lot about it, but uh, we, we've had for some some quite some time we've had like a three or four individuals across the state that were able to to uh, train the trainers and I really feel like that that needs to be something uh, that needs to originate from from this office um, for for no other reason other than to just keep things once we get things like we like we feel like they need to be and we we get standardized training we all need to be involved with each other so that we all know what everybody's doing and and so we need to we need to do the training we we train hunter education instructors the same way we there were four of me across the state at that time plus a statewide coordinator and and we use the same training materials tra methods uh, we we taught our instructors what what we felt like needed to be taught based on not just what TWRA thought, but what those instructors were able to to uh, to offer as well. And we won't. I see this as being the only difference in you guys and my volunteer instructors back in those days is you guys are doing this to make a living, and those guys were doing it as volunteers. Uh, didn't get paid a penny for it. So, um, so we want we want this to be. Uh, kind of a, a training program for you, by you, and of you, and um, the train the trainer thing would be nice to be what? be that same thing, and for us to be involved in it. Not right now. God dang it! Did I just? Hit... Other other questions? <laughs> okay. Excuse me. We don't have any other questions. Let me thank everyone for taking the time out. out hey, Cody, I, I think you're trying to speak. We can't hear you. How about no. that? Uh, thank better. you. I'm sorry. You Excuse me. I could hear her anyway. But... <laughs> of course, we're in the same room. <laughs> That's all right. Thank you. I, I said we don't have any other questions. I'd like to take just a moment to thank you for taking the time out of your afternoon. Uh, and it looks like we do have another little note here. Uh, maybe a couple of them coming in, so I do want to make sure I get this on record here. Uh, instructors, all I see is great point, Keith. Instructors worth worthless if the instructors don't know how to train. That's exactly why we're having this class. I said uh, earlier we do have everyone's hopefully training course in your test and we've determined that this is uh, as as you probably know is needed all over the state has the state considered officers be required to have a test through a psychiatrist especially for armed officers that is something that uh, yes we're going to look look at and with our legal staff there's other problems there but as it is now the answer is no this is law overseas in many countries in Europe. What, what is? But to having a psychiatric, psych, psychiatric. Yeah, I think that was. Is that was what we're meaning? Okay. Yeah. That, that was from the same. Yeah, that was from the same yeah. guy. Uh, okay. All right. From overseas. All right. 
You know, David, that is that is something that um, to be a certified uh, police officer, if you go through the post commission and go through the academy, that is something that is required there. So I, I see where you're where you're coming from with that. Uh, yes, I do too. But you do need to remember there is a difference between a security officer and a police officer. And like I said, I'm going to go ahead. We're going to end this uh, seminar. Uh, please send whatever more questions that you have. I'll be glad to take them. Jeff will be glad to take them. Uh, like I said, we will be forming after we have the uh, Middle Tennessee, which is in October. Maybe I think it's October the 20th. Uh, we'll be having one more seminar. That way we've covered all the trainers in uh, the state of Tennessee. We will be forming a, a committee to and probably end up doing it just like this virtually. And it probably take more than one one conversation to get this. This is sure. yours. When we finish this, we want you to know this is your input this is what you need this is what you want to help us do and we're here to actually in reverse help you do this uh jeff you want, got any closing statements i just want to say uh thank you each one of you for attending today uh had some uh some great questions i think we had one more question there at the end and like i say they disappear but while Cody's uh, pulling that up, um, yes, we will. We will. We've been making some notes as to who is in attendance, and uh, we will be sending you a um, uh, a certificate for two hours of CE continuing education that that you'll be able to use. I, I would like to go back and say something about that. Um, if if any of you guys have some websites that you'd like to share with me matter of fact i uh when i was doing my uh, advanced emt training last week finishing it up i usually go through vanderbilt every year and they have a an iserve conference well they didn't have it this year they decided not to have it because of covid uh, they did a couple of things online but i went to the state ems website and found a place and uh I found a place about active shooting on a, on a medical website, uh, active shooters. And so it was pretty good. And I will share that link with any of you that, that want to know about it. It was good for two hours. But if any of you guys know ab about some good uh, websites that you can share with me, I would like to um, to make maybe compile a list of those uh, because I found it very frustrating finding a good place to get CEUs that uh, that didn't cost an arm and a leg and you know you're gonna have to pay for some of them uh, I usually paid 100 and 130 bucks to go to Vanderbilt and um, and attend that two-day conference but you know if, if you're studying emergency medicine Vanderbilt's a good place to do it because they they wrote the book on most of it so but if you if y'all know of a, of, of a good website or a good something a good experience that you had or a bad one if, if you know of one that, that maybe cost you too much and didn't get uh, didn't get good information, let me know about that. But I'd like to share that with everybody, and because um, uh, I know how frustrating it is to find a good good website. So we got another question. Yeah, let's go ahead and take this, and we're going to end this. Is there anything that says that we're going to go to Cody? We can't we can't hear you. Oh, you're muted again. Oh, here we go. Uh, sorry. Is there anything that says your organization can't have the MMPI performed? And that was from James. James, uh, no, sir, we're, we're not going to tell you what you can do and cannot do in your own organization. That's a policy for your company to decide what you're going to what you're going to perform and not perform. We won't be uh, telling you these things. Now, please. Uh, let me see. Then we got some other names here, which I'm we won't go into here. Um, I said that they'll be serving on the committee. Thank you. I want to make sure I get all this printed off. A couple more names. Anybody that'd be interested. Now it won't be probably that big a committee, but uh, they will sit down and figure out. I'm sure they'll have someone who can do armed, who can do unarmed. We'll have someone who, who's a PSO, someone who's uh. A contract security company um 
probably one of the nuclears or something of this nature. There, there'll be a combination of people that will be on this committee. But thank you very much. Are you, Jeff, were you finished? Yeah, yeah. I just, once again, I appreciate all of you. Uh, I enjoy talking with you when you call me. I, I hope that I'm always uh, able to provide you with some kind of guidance. I know there's nothing worse than than calling one person and getting passed to somebody else. Uh, I know that how aggravating that is for me. So I, I like to I like to fix things when you call me. But if I can, I'll tell you that and, and send you on somewhere else. But uh, thank you so much for attending today. Thank you for your attention, your good questions. Uh, and, hey, everything. Hey, Jeff. Good sorry. Questions. I, yeah, sorry. I I don't mean to cut you off. I just wanted to jump in real quick and say, sure. um, if you if you called in on the phone. Um, I know we had a few people do that late. If you just want to email Jeff and let him know that you were attending by phone um, so we can, you know, record down your name. Because we only need that if you joined in by phone because the problem is we just we can't see your name when you do that. Um, so if you just want to shoot him an email and let him know, um, you know, we'll document right, yeah. that you were here. Um, and then uh, – the other thing I was going to say, Keith Sarton uh, messaged me. He said uh, Vanderbilt is doing CEU every Friday free. And then um, Jeremy Ray Wampler said that Dark Angel Medical is a good course to take. They do offer some basic videos on their site that are free. Good. And, yes, I am aware of the Vanderbilt. Uh, I just got that email a day or two ago, and I'm probably going to partake in those for, for the next uh, – two-year cycle so uh, that's that's good information thank you very, very much for that FEMA yes I, I'm, a, I'm familiar with FEMA as well I will tell you guys one thing real quick about FEMA they they tell you that you're for every hour they give you like a tenth of a point and, uh, so so that to me that's that that still means an hour. So if you if you do something for two tenths, I'm I'm I, I give you two hours for that. So uh, if you come up with something that says uh, uh, one point two or whatever, that that that's gonna I know what that means. That's that's gonna be your twelve hours or whatever. So any other any others real quick before we go? Again, thank you and. Um, Y'all, all of you stay safe, uh, keep your families healthy and safe, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, walk, we'll walk down this path together here. Thank you very much.